Welcome to Light Muse. We're your hosts, Flannery Underwood and Jessica Cabasi. And today we are talking with Obi. He is a fashion and portrait photographer based in Dallas, Texas. So Obi, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So before we jump in, Jess and I both thought it was important to take just a very quick moment to preface this episode. You know, we had episodes that were ready for this month, but we decided to stop our weekly content to really just take a moment to pause and listen and reflect on what's happening in the world right now and specifically with the Black Lives Matter movement. And we really didn't feel right speaking on behalf of the movement and we wanted to give someone from the photography community who was a person of color a voice and platform and so you know we reached out to Obi because he's been very vocal about photographers in the community exploiting the movement and we really wanted to have him on to share his perspective so Obi again thank you so much for coming on we really appreciate it and you know I kind of just want to start by asking when did you first start to notice photographers posting content that was related to the Black Lives Matter movement and what to you really drew the line between support of the movement and exploiting the movement? Uh, So I saw it on Twitter and I was just like why like this doesn't make any sense because I know I know like the uh, the photographer who did it was talking about trying to raise awareness for the movement and it's just like if you want to raise awareness like people have been sharing links to sign petitions and to donate money and to like email your mayors and people and you're doing a photo shoot that has a black girl and there's tape across the mouth that says I can't breathe and you're basically just trying to capitalize on pain and suffering of people to um, to um, build your um, clout base, basically. And it just gets really insulting when you look at their um, pages. And it's all like, there's no black model on their page. You could like scroll, 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 and it's all like the same. And then you see this one post with a black model and then it feels like, well, not, it doesn't feel like it is a trend for them because after some time, they're going to go back to shooting just white models again until God forbid someone else dies at the hands of, um, the, of, um, the cops. And then they're back again with the black lives matter photo shoot. So the way that I see it, it just, it's not something that anyone should be doing. Um, if you wanted to document it and like raise um, and raise awareness, you could go to the um, protest and take pictures, but make sure to like, you know, like protect people's identities. But I'm just not on board with the Black Lives Matter photo shoots. It's it's um, it's extremely um, performative. It's exploitative. Um, it's just it's very eye service it's like look at me i'm supporting black lives matter movement support me and i'm shooting this one black girl out of the 2000 white girls i've shot but that's how i feel about it i the intentions might be in the right place but it's very bad execution very very bad execution I especially hate the tape on the mouth with like I can't breathe because that's someone's last words how do you how do you watch that and you feel like oh I'm gonna put this on this girl's mouth and put flowers on the tape like people are fighting for their lives and you're putting flowers on tape come on it doesn't make sense it, it I feel like you have like to 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 like see that and think, oh, this is fine. Let's do this. It's just come on. Like, and you know, there's other people who started to do things similar to people, that. Yeah, I saw um, I saw a few um, others, and like I've just been like going down. Like I've been basically trying to cyber bully all of them because like <laughs> they because I feel like talking to people nicely isn't working anymore. So if I 
if I'm just really stern with you and I'm just like, this is this is really, really stupid of you. You need to like understand why this is wrong and mm-hmm. sl- like st- still try to educate, but like very stern. I think it, the the more correct way for me would would say I think you're just calling people out. To be honest, I don't yeah. think I, like I haven't seen you bo- like bullying anybody. Like I saw you say <laughs> I saw you yeah. say something was maybe tone deaf, which I mean it, it is true. It's, it is very tone deaf. It it is very um, tone deaf. Like at such a time that people are out there marching and protesting, and the the people are getting are getting um tear gassed and they're getting shot shot with, with rubber bulletin all you can do is to put a flower on tape and like put a smoke bomb behind the model come on it's tone deaf if you can't use your platform with eight million followers to tell them hey go sign this petition go donate money to this fund email your um mayor or your sheriff or whoever Tell them what, tell them how you feel. Tell them what needs to change. That's how to use your platform. Like, I'm not saying um, that they should like completely just stop posting on, on social media and stop sharing their work, but like just use your platform in a more meaningful way. Because again, this is performative activism as at its finest. There's no real essence to it. Like, I'm not. Like, I'm sorry, but I'm not gonna see a photo shoot like that and be like, I'm I'm so moved by it. And like, I know mo- like all of my other friends who are also black black photographers are not moved by it. All my friends who are black but no photographers are not moved by it. So it's like we want you as an ally, but we don't want that sort of allyship because it just feels very condescending. Yeah, it's ba- basically like opportunistic. You know, you're taking it, it, this it movement and turning it into something else for for your benefit, basically. Extremely opportunistic. Like, you... It feels very vulture-like to me. Like, you, they see um, um, a dead body and, like, they, they just go prey on it. Like, it's just not something that you should be doing, ever. And, you know, you weren't the only one who felt this way. You know, we, me and Flannery both checked out the comments, and a lot of people agree with you. I mean, yeah. let me read some of these. We have, so I mean, so a lot of people are telling him, take this down. This is very disrespectful. You're capitalizing off, off of black people. Um, it's, you know, like you were saying, it's opportunistic. Um, mm-hmm. And someone was saying that they tagged a sponsor in that. Oh, yeah. So, know, as well. So so he tagged the smoke bomb um, sponsor. And it's just like, okay, that's where we know you're doing this um, for um, clout. And it's also like, if you watch the video and, and, and like you watch his other videos, it's, it's like the same format he uses for his TikToks. And something about it feels very disingenuous. Mm-hmm. It's just like not right. The same. I'm. I'm gonna walk up to two strangers. One is white. One is black, and get them to like do a photo shoot for me. And it's just like, first off, we know they're not strangers. Secondly, oh, we know, you guys. Why? <laughs> Come on. I know. Like, I know they're not strangers because, like, I've seen somewhere he like twist glitter on them, and I'm just like, who? <laughs> who just wants? Like, who wants glitter? thrown on them when they're out going about their day that um, stuff is hard to take off you know ever use glitter in a photo shoot that stuff I stays have. forever you'll find I that have. like 10 years from then and like my uh my old bag still has glitter in it no that's telling how bad you, it is telling you. it never goes anywhere it's just there forever i swear I swear. And that's why I don't really use glitter in my shoots. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, I do agree with you. And and here's the thing. Uh, we're not trying to, uh, you know, we're not trying to hate on this guy for any reason. Let's say, mm-hmm. let's give him the benefit of the doubt and say he wasn't educated and he really had good intentions. You know, let's play devil's advocate here. You know, what would you say to photographers who are doing, who are seeing these kind of photo shoots and doing them? What would you say to them? Oh, so when I, the, uh, the first time I, called him out for doing this um oh, you, actually oh, got you did you message him privately no i just put it on um twitter because okay. like um actually i did comment on his tiktok and he took down my 
uh, my um, really? comment. So yeah, oh. she clearly doesn't care. But um, when I did it on Twitter, I actually got a bunch of messages from people who were like asking me how to go about it if they were to do something like that. I, I said point blank, don't do it. If you wanted to do a photo shoot, you could, you could maybe do one like celebrating black people or like just be more aware of your model selection, your casting, because that's something that as like photographers we don't always talk about. And like, I understand that some people are in like small towns in, in the in the middle of um, Omaha or wherever. And they don't have as much diversity, but still, like, just be more mindful of how you're casting your models. So that way it's not like, now that this is happening, you're shooting more black models, you know? Exactly. I, I, you know, and here's the thing. We believe that it is important to be inclusive. And maybe those photographers who primarily worked with more just white models, maybe they're seeing this and they're like, you know, I have been absent in this and I need to start including more people of color. We absolutely do not want to shame those people, first of all. Yeah, we, we think don't. It's, it's so important. But I think you made a very good point and that in using this specific movement in this certain situation to promote your photography it's just it's it's not okay you know it's not it, it's just not the time to be doing something like that and yeah. like i don't know it's just it's just very uh very off to me and i actually had like about four of my model friends they texted me and they were like "Obi, this guy just messaged me to shoot and I check his page and there's no black model on there. And like, I got like four of those texts from my friends, like all different people. And they all find it so weird that it, that it took, that it took this long for them to be hit up by like some random photographers. Mm -hmm. And everyone one is not even in the, in, um, the um, country anymore. She's back in Nigeria right now. And some, some guy from New York hit her up to shoot. And she was just like, read like read the room you yeah know. you know i think jess brought up a good point of these people who are unlearning what mm. they've been taught or they're trying to educate themselves they're trying to do this in a positive supportive way and brands as well you know this goes beyond just individuals where if you walk into a Sephora and Ulta, what do you see? You literally see a range of skin tones on the shelf. You literally mm -hmm. see race visually. And, you know, over the past year, two, three years, I would say, there's been a strong pushback on brands who are not showing inclusivity. You know, I think Beauty Blender example, when they came out with their foundation shade range was a great example. They came out with like, I don't know, a couple of shades and all of them were super light and they got huge blowback. And, you know, it's, it's this interesting place that we're in where these individuals or these small, small boutique brands want to be inclusive. But right. maybe they, as a brand, can only afford to do three shades. They want to do more. You know, it's like we need to be thinking in incremental steps. If you are a large corporate company, there is no excuse. You need to be representing everyone. If you have a fair shade range, you should have a deep, deep skin tone as well. Right. And People should be conscious of, like you're saying, the casting of models and brands need to be thinking about inclusivity of their outward facing products, but also when they hire, you know, shout out to Milk Makeup who did a transparency of who was in their company and mm -hmm. they did a breakdown of the percentage of the people of color that they had on their staff and the people in higher like levels of management as well. And they put that out there for transparency, but also to start a dialogue and to say, we want to do better. You know, we yeah. have a good percentage, but we want to do more. So I think that's a good place. You know, I think my question for you is like, what is the best advice you can give for people? Like Jess was saying, like, if you didn't shoot with as many black people, because you did live in Oklahoma and you are surrounded by white people, how do you you or like reach out or start that conversation and 
how do you do it tastefully in a way where it's not offensive? Um, I think like the only way that it, that it would be offensive is if you're like trying to like capitalize on what's going on right now. Um, mm-hmm. I think if some random photographer in Minnesota or somewhere was like, okay, I need to, um, get, um, like get more, um, diversity in my book um that's totally fine like go on and do it just a and be mindful of the concepts you're shooting because like i've had like people my friends tell me that someone or sounds like do a um native a um, native american headdress shoot and they were like no that that is not going to happen you know or like one of my friends said this um, This guy asked her to like, paint like her whole body black and do like, a nude shoot. And she was just like, uh-uh. She doesn't want the backlash. So just being like, you could honestly go online, reach out to like people. Um, I would say traveling works. Um, and, and like not everyone has the money to travel. But again, just start with, start with who you have around you. You don't have to be shooting like the Adusa Ketch and like the Naomi's of the world. You can start with the girl next door or just whoever, or like you can go to like the um, the, the next town. But I just feel like everyone should learn to be more inclusive in their work and just kind of showcase like a bunch of different people because um i was talking to the dallas observer and also my uh my friend um did this thread on like how photographs have been used to like um weaponize the um the the destruction of people basically and i was talking about how like the um the you the europeans that went to africa back then like the pictures they took back were to show Africans as like savages. So it it goes to like tell you that like there's a power to storytelling and like photography is such a strong form of storytelling and like if you easily just like only show a bad side of people, that's what everyone is going to believe and that's when it becomes a stereot um a stereotype. So um, I think I, I, I kind of like forgot what I was talking about just now. <laughs> no, that was all great. <laughs> but yeah, no, um, stories, like stories can easily like malign or like um, help people in um, advancing. And I feel like in America, the uh, perspective is usually seen from like the white eye. Mm-hmm. So if we have more people telling stories of different people and telling stories of like black people of asian people of uh hispanic people of just different races of people and not just showing the same beauty standards over and over and over and over and over again and not just in front of the camera but also behind the camera like yes. american vogue for the first time in 2018 and 124 years of their existence had the first black photographer shoot a cover and it blows your mind because you're like this is american vogue i can literally name like 20 black photographers that are doing better than like and like not to like talk trash about the other like photographers who are shooting their um who are shooting for them right now but what i've seen is that people who are shooting for them now were shooting for them back in the 90s too and like I just want to hear more young voices mm-hmm. on, you know, like, I'm not saying you, they should be aged out of the industry, but like, I also want to hear from younger voices and just more, more diverse voices. I agree 100%. And it goes beyond Vogue too. There's, you know, th- I mean, I'm not trying to call out any specific camp, but there's camera companies, especially who oh, yeah. they have collectives now and they have ambassadors and there's a lack of, I would say that there is definitely a lack of inclusivity. I did see that and I went on, on like like the three big brands and like I was very pleased with Sony because not only was Sony I heard of like speaking out on what's going on right now. Um, Sony has a good like 
diverse group. They have mm-hmm. a lot of um, Hispanic photographers and like Asian photographers and black photographers and white photographers. So like, and also like the um, my friend was also saying that Sony's trying to listen to people. So they they just had their first black female photographer in in the um, ambassador group, which it's kind of like. Come on, it's long overdue. It's long right. overdue. Mm-hmm. I mean, come on. But still, like, it's better than when I go on some other brands and I only see like mm-hmm. one, like, there's really one black photographer, and then that's it. That's it for diversity. And it just, it just hurts because like we keep like pouring our money into these brands, and clearly they don't care about us enough to be like, we need to like stop uplifting more people like you you know it is our responsibility to educate ourselves and just like you're saying you went on and you saw what sony was saying about the movement you did your research and you put the time in to really understand what that brand was about you know brands Mm. hold values as well Mm -hmm. and i think going back to what you were saying earlier i think it's really interesting because photography is freedom of speech, right? It is. On some level. It starts as on that. But then it goes to a second level of storytelling, right? Which also implies that there is this curation. And, you know, for years now, I think, at least Jess and I have been talking about it, that Instagram is a curated place. Like, you know, what you see is not always reality. And Mm. when the invention of Facetune and all these things, our brains are being trained to think yeah. that Instagram and these models are real life when they aren't. And I think we've had to do a lot of unlearning there. And this is like mm. the next step that this is our responsibility to do our own research, especially like me as I'm not a person of color. And it's my responsibility to educate myself and to go out and to talk to other people and to learn as much as I can. And yeah. I think, you know, people are struggling I would just say, like, then take it into your own hands. You know, I, yeah. I look at my parents and, like, they they lived through the civil rights movement. That's crazy to me to even think about that. We are living through another civil rights movement right now today. But we have had to do a lot of unlearning. And it's just going to get better from here on out. But I absolutely mm. agree with you. More young people and more diversity across the board. Across and we're the, the generation board. that's going to make it happen. You know, as a black photographer in the community, what struggles have you faced? Have, like setting up photo shoots? Have you, have you felt any type of discrimination when you're trying to shoot with a certain model? Or have a, like a, a, situ- a situation during where you're taking pictures? For me, mainly, it's been just trying to get signed to an agency because I have been trying for, like, over a year now. I reach out to them, and they're just like, ah, that's all right. We'll get back to you. Actually, most times they don't reply me at all. They, they, they just ignore me. But then, like, and, like, not to, like, brag on myself or anything, but I go on, like, who they're presenting, and, like, I feel like I could give them... A little bit better than what they have right now. Your work is amazing. But, I saw I saw it and you've yeah. grown so much by the way. Like I Thank saw you. your work from the beginning and you've done some really girl I'm about to you. ask you how you got a couple of these pictures. You know, like what lady <laughs> what lens? <laughs> like so good. But also I'm but, gonna throw this out there, like you don't even need an agency. You don't need like, an agent. You know, to spend I'll be your time agent. like <laughs> with social media. Like, Jess and I, I mean, Jess found you through, I think, Twitter or, like, through Instagram. social yeah. media, Instagram. And it's like, yeah. you know, you have this voice and you have these platforms to use. And, you know, it, it, we've we've talked to other people also about, like, whether it's good to have an agent, whether a mm. manager or, like, what the right path is for people. And it's different for absolutely everyone. So it's not the wrong thing. But, you know, also, a, like, an agency that doesn't give you the time of day and you feel like it's maybe race-based, it's like, don't give them your time. Like, you have amazing right. work. Like, take it elsewhere, you know? I just feel like... I need one just to, like, get my foot in the door. Just, you know, just just so it's like, okay, um, there's someone actually, like, trying to put my name out there. But, um, I mean, it's 
it's whatever though but don't give up like don't give up it is only a matter of time someone will sign you 100 i've seen your work do not give up don't let people discourage you don't let the rejections get to you you got this that's what's like, like the end goal for you like what do you ideally want to do with photography um so for me it's creatively it will be to just shoot, shoot like fashion for like to shoot vogue but i saw designers. that vogue spread by the way on your twitter your twitter is popping <laughs> your twitter is popping i saw that it. vogue spread people have been telling me congrats i'm just like it's not real it's not real <laughs> stop telling me congrats please it's making me sad it's not real but um my 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 end goal like from a creative standpoint would be to shoot more like fashion and just travel to like destinations like if money wasn't a factor i would just travel like all over the world go to like the um the middle east um oh South you want to come where do you want to go in the middle east <laughs> i so i've actually been to um dubai 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 come to in, lebanon man forget in dubai. <laughs> 07. did you like it i loved it i had to go to lebanon too oh wait so you haven't been to lebanon or you want to go I haven't, oh, I would, but I want if to. If you need a tour guide, I'm there. <laughs> okay. I love taking people to the Middle East. Like, it's my I, favorite thing in the world. I would love to go to Lebanon. I would love to go to... Uh, I think I want to go to Saudi Arabia. Oh, no. Sis, no. no I, don't, I don't think I want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, listen, I feel like I'm... Anyone from Saudi Arabia listening? Like, you're Arab? Come on. I'm Arab. We, we both know. We both know. But um, I've also heard about, like, Doha as well. Doha? Um, I've never been there. But Flandry's been to Qatar, and she's... Well, yeah, she said I it's interesting. To Doha. It's interesting? Yeah. It was interesting. It was very interesting. It felt very it surreal. It was very surreal. Okay. It was... They were prepping for the... Which, now I don't think it's happened, but I think the World Cup 2020 for soccer yeah. or something. Yeah. Uh, I went to, like, maybe a year and a half, two years ago, and... Yeah, it was very surreal to, like, watch them prepare for that. Um, Dubai made me feel, feel extremely poor. Oh, sweetie, me yeah. too. Me too. <laughs> Dubai made Everybody me feel extremely poor. Everybody <laughs> poor. Middle East is beautiful. You would definitely love it, especially for photography. I would love to plan a photographer's trip. I'm 100% serious. I would love to plan a photographer's trip where we do like a little tour. We, get, we can go to like Jordan. We can go to Lebanon. Ooh. Turkey's not in in the Middle East, but we still like to add Turkey in there. Um, Turkey. Turkey is a beautiful Greece Turkey. as well. Um, Listen, I go everywhere. So can you, I, I, my brain was like wandering, but... Can you give us like a shout out to some amazing like black photographers or people who you think are killing it? Even maybe like photographers from Nigeria or where you're from. Mm-hmm. Okay, so uh, we're gonna start with uh, Kevin Fights. Uh, Kevin is absolutely insane. Uh, he actually got me into like the wide angle because he shoots with a fourteen on eighteen, somewhere in that range. Uh, He's my really, really, really good friend. He's from Dallas as well. Um, then there's Mikey Oshai. He's back in Nigeria. Um, he's also insane. There's uh, Daniel Obasi who stars and does um, fo- who who stars and does um, photography as well. Then there's Joshua Kissy. Um, he is really, really, really good as well. Um, I'm in love with his work. One of my all-time favorites has to be Dante Morris. He's from Atlanta. Um, if you see his work, like you're, you're just going to be so shocked that he's not bigger than he is, because his work is just that good. Um, who else? Who else? I'm trying to like think of names to, like put out there, because the like the there's um a lot of amazing black photographers there is Braylon um, that i follow on twitter and instagram uh there's miles lofton i'm trying to think of names you're gonna I'm have to give us names. this whole list we'll have yeah. to put them and link them below in the description but we'll include them yeah in the i'm description. bad with names i'm trying to remember like all the names i've um said so far there's also um Ken, I don't know her real name. I just know her Twitter username. Uh, it's like Internet Baby. Uh, she her work is insane. Uh, we'll have to retweet her. You're yeah. you're popping on Twitter. She yeah, Twitter is a 
Twitter's a mess right now. Can you talk me. to us a little bit about your Twitter? Because I, I mean, I think I look on your Twitter. I'm like, this guy is hilarious. Like, I love how you're just, you just post whatever you want. You Twitter, post a lot of your work. So Twitter, something that I, something that I realized when I started using Twitter for my, for, for my um, photography is that I can't use it the way I use Instagram. Instagram was more like, this is my photography. That's all I have to offer. I'm professional. These are all my pictures. That's it. That's Twitter what it is. is me like talking about whatever comes to mind. And I've learned that like in that like in order to build a brand, you have to show your personality. You have to show you have to give people a reason to follow you other than just your work. So I just say whatever the hell I want to say on um, on Twitter and Luckily, people don't follow me for saying it, but <laughs> it's mostly just me, like, talking trash the whole time on Twitter. And it's fun. Um, it's it's almost like a diary where you're just, like, talking to yourself. What what advice would you give to people who are not POC, that are in the photography community, mm-hmm. that are listening right now? Um, I would say, so, like I said before, be mindful of your cast and that's that's like such a big issue for me because like especially when you're in a major city there's no reason why you should be shooting like the same type of people every time um be mindful of your casting and just like learn to like listen and use your privilege to also like elevate artists as well um privilege is such a big thing and I think more people realize that like they have a certain urge over someone based on how they look the better it is because like you can really use that to um, bring more voices to light so um, the main thing for me that I would say is just cast like more diverse models and just use your platform to speak on injustices because it's not enough to just shoot a black model and say, I've done my um, part. When stuff is happening, we need you to also like use your platform and say, this is wrong. Not do a Black Lives Matter photo shoot, just this is wrong and spread awareness in a meaningful way about why this is wrong. Absolutely. And I'm just going to tack one more thing on talking about the brands, you know, hiring people of color on all levels to represent, you know, if you have a team of 100% all white people, and you shoot one black model, that there is no justice there, you know, having representation across all levels is so important. Do you do you um, do you guys remember that Pepsi ad with Kendall Kendall Ah! Jenner? I wonder where is she now? I wonder how many people of color were in that ad. Like we're, we're like in the we're like in the behind the scenes like with the ideas and all of that. Because that's where it goes to show you that to Pepsi, um the issue with police brutality is all about giving them a Pepsi and then that solves it. But it's so much more deeper than that. Like there's a history and it's like it's embedded in the system and how the and how the nation works so handing someone a pepsi just doesn't fix the violence and that's where if they had more black and just people of color in the room when they're applying that ad it probably won't have run because like they would have been like this is very tone deaf this is very this diminishes what we go through every day. Exactly. The Pepsi doesn't solve it. Pepsi at all. doesn't solve it. <laughs> of course. The Pepsi <laughs> like come on now. What would you have said if they brought that idea? Like you were on the on the board for Pepsi and they're so the board, I would have told them, um, this is not going to run. If this runs, I'm going to quit. Obi, delete this, delete this. Delete d- d- delete <laughs> this right you would now. Have t- you would have tweeted Obi would have tweeted and been like, Pepsi, don't do this. I, I no, like it just it's just very like it, it wants to like be a feel good like oh look at him I'm just gonna hand him a Pepsi and like fix all of this but it doesn't work that way and I feel like if you had someone who has come from that experience then like 
you know that they will tell you that it doesn't work that way. But then again, it doesn't only mean like, because like, maybe they had one or two black people in the room, but like, were their voices listened to? Were their opinions asked for? So it's not enough to just hire black people in your company. It's also asking what their opinion and like, what, like how to feel about what you're about to run as an ad or whatever. Cause like, that's like super important. Cause you can't just have them as like, um, your diversity spots filled up. You also have to like, you know, you, you hire them for a job, listen to them on like what they have to say and stuff like that. Obi, you do a lot of photo shoots. Can you tell us, you know, about maybe your favorite photo shoot, your most memorable photo shoot? My favorite photo shoot, I still, I'm so pissed because, like, I still can't release it. Uh, I did it for my my, uh, my friend who's a model in L.A. and it's for his music. And we did it back in November in Santa Monica. And I, I'm just waiting for the music so I can, like, release the pictures. But no, but um, I think my new favorite photo shoot would have to be uh, the one that I just did a few weeks ago. Um, the one that did the fake Vogue spread on which is one like the rainbow colored dress. I really like that picture a lot. And also the one of um, the model in the orange suit. Um, I'll have to like send that to you guys later. But I like that shoot because you guys know how like how fast Sony's die. I had my battery on 25% and we shot six looks with that. What? Oh, bless you. I would, like, turn it off. I would have been sweating. You turned it off after every shot? Yeah. (laughs) Like, what I would do was just, like, hey, pose real quick. Click, 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 click. Okay, let's go here. Click, 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 click. Okay, click, click. Okay, next look. And I got, like, some of my favorite pictures from that shoot. But, um... We need to get you up to the R3 because those batteries last way longer. The R2s, they got the tiny ones still. Mm Mm-hmm. That's the next thing for you. After okay. the next lens, after the wide angle, up to the three. <laughs> oh, but you need an extra battery. I have two batteries, actually, but I didn't charge either of them I before that shoot. I love didn't charge oh it. Oh, my God. That's, that's, uh, me. that's all you need to know about me, about being unprepared. I, <laughs> I didn't charge it, and I knew about the shoot, like, way beforehand, but I showed up with one battery on 25% and one that was, like, completely dead. And, um, yeah... It was just a mess. Do you feel like that made you shoot better? Like the pressure of having 25% on your pad of shooting film? I think, yeah. I think it made me shoot with more intention. And and it wasn't just like, oh, let's see how this looks. This looks cute. It was more of me just like thinking about my shots more. And I'm just like, I want to get this with this outfit. This this outfit will look really cool here. And like, I want the, the light in this way. So... I have it all set up before I shoot instead of just like going like shutter crazy and just um, clicking for like 20 minutes straight. But it really helped with me getting more, um, more um, thoughtful shots and not just like random pictures all across the board. You've inspired me to do a challenge now where I don't charge my battery and I shoot and then I just wait till it dies. I swear to God, I'm going to do it on YouTube and be like, thank you. Will you be in one of the videos? Maybe I'll make I, it into a series. I let, when are you going to be in LA next? Well, I'm waiting for LA to actually open because it's closed right now. Yeah. But I would love to collaborate with you and, and do something. Going to do the battery Ooh. challenge? Oh my the God, battery. let's do it. <laughs> I love it. Let's do it. We'll pick a model and do a... A 20% battery. 20%. 25%. 25%. I will purposely oh not charge any of my batteries. I'll use mine until it's like down to 20%. Then I'll Actually, how about it. like I'll put my battery in like water and then I'll just like just mm-hmm. put it. I'll put it out in the sun, burning sun, and, and then I'll use it. <laughs> then I'll use it. Oh my God. I don't know about all of that. Obi's like, I'm not doing the video. I don't know about that one yet, Jess. <laughs> What you need to do is you need to do like battery roulette where there's like four batteries and they each have different percentages Stop. and one might be 5%. Yo, one might be like that's 20. The idea. That's, the idea. that's it. There you go. Can we do it? All three of us? Yeah, okay. I'm down. I'll film I'm you guys. Down. I'll record Dude, that one. Obi, would you do that? Battery roulette? Uh, yeah, I would love to. Oh my God. That sounds like so much fun. To. Once everything opens. <laughs> By the way, can you tell us a little bit about how you 
light your photos? Because I see that you do a little bit of everything. You've done like the more foggy, very, mm-hmm. me, you know, mesmerizing, glossy look, but then you have really contrasted photos. Tell us a little yeah. bit about how you light your photos. So for uh, for the um, foggy, like hazy look, and let me just have like um, a UV filter that I like put chapstick on. And sometimes when there's no chapstick, I just like swipe my forehead and rub it Stop. under. Stop. It Love works. It. Trust me, it works. And then just take my shirt and like wipe the middle out. Um, but I'm trying to get like an like an actual soft filter. But whenever I do like um, harsh light, I just use a, a um, reflector and have the model with the back to the light, and then bounce the lights back on them with the silver side of the reflector. Um, I never really enjoy shooting like direct sunlight just because it, it it creates like a lot of um, shadows. Mm-hmm. But I love harsh light when there's like a reflector involved. But yeah, that's how I that's how I light normally. I I recently got studio set up this January for my aunt. Um, she gave it to me for free. Yeah, auntie. Wow, the hookup. Um, Shout out to the aunt. Shout right. out. Right, like she. Um, so she used to do photography as well but she just never really like got into it but when she said that she bought like a lot of expensive stuff so what did she send she, you she gave me two alien bees oh those B, are good like, lights yeah the b800 so i have two of those and i have like a huge like soft box and i have like two umbrellas i have some bandas i have like a snoot for like spotlights nice. and I got them like fresh out of the box because like, she never opened them, but she's had them for like a few years now. So that's uh, that was a nice surprise to get from her. Um, but I'm trying to get more familiar with my studio um, setup because that's um, that's one that I'm trying to like really figure out right now. Do you shoot mostly natural light? I prefer to shoot natural light, but like. In the winter, I'm just doing studio because it's too cold to go outside. I feel you. It's far too cold. I, I, I just can't do it. But I prefer natural light, honestly. Um, there's just something more interesting about it. I don't know. Just like you have more... Con- well, not, not more control. You have less control, which makes it more exciting. Yes, exactly. Because mm-hmm. exactly. it's like, is the sun going to go down? Is it going to start raining? I don't know. But we're gonna figure it out. But with studio, it's like you're more relaxed and you're just like, okay, this is what I want. This is what I want. But it's 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 like also tough to like figure out how to get what you want and you have to like translate in in um, the shot. We'll have Flannery come set up your lights. She's good at that. Please. I got <laughs> you. I I have been trying so hard to like get a to get a hang of. Um, of lighting in studio and it's just like me too such a mess listen we gotta learn we gotta learn French together we gotta learn Arabic we gotta (laughs) learn the lighting together we gotta we gotta lot where do we want to start when are we starting (laughs) let's start right now okay let's go so um (laughs) (laughs) oh my god but yeah um I prefer natural light it's it's um it's a lot more exciting it keeps you on your toes you know. Yeah, I agree. You know, and Jess and I actually did a whole podcast talking about this, but one thing we didn't talk about and that I've been thinking about a lot is like when you are outside, the blue of the sky creates a different color tone. And like if you shoot by a tree, you're reflecting green onto the model. And like mm-hmm. there's so many textures and colors and like little moments that you can have these like happy accidents happen that you wouldn't have experienced in a studio and I think both of them have their place obviously but like yeah I I agree with you guys like shooting outdoors is exciting because you don't really know what you're gonna get and it's it's problem solving it's a big puzzle that you have to put together at every single second and it's continually shifting so it's like that plus like it's so fun the sun is just yeah. like destroying you and just like about to pass out. <laughs> ah, where, do, where do you shoot? Texas. Oh, be you okay yeah. over there? <laughs> well, we come Not to Michigan really. and we don't have any sun here. Yeah. Really? I mean, okay, I'm being dramatic. Everyone in Michigan is going to, everyone, I'm going to leave, they're going to leave hate comments like, Michigan has sunlight. Okay, I'm just, for like three days out of the year, yes. 
Tweet it out again. That's crazy. <laughs> what's your What's your favorite time to shoot? Because mine personally is like a cloudy day. Mine is a nice like high noon. Well, Ooh. not high noon. More like four p.m. Just because like high noon, high noon the sun is like right above you. I like when it's like slightly on the side, so that way I can just bounce the light. Yeah. Back on the monitor, so like three, four p.m. Um, I feel like that's a that's a good time for me to shoot when I'm shooting when I'm shooting outside, just because um, there's plenty of sun to work with, and I love my reflector, and I also love shooting at like six point three and seven point one, so I get to really like um, open up my app. Is it open or is it closed? Cl- close. Close my aperture, and like like get get like the background in the shot as well. Hmm? I was gonna say, are you the type of photographer who wakes up at like five in the morning and get that sun, the sunrise <laughs> shot? I wish. I wish. <laughs> I wish I could wake up at five in the morning. That's normally when I go to bed. Five in the morning. <laughs> no, um, I um, I believe that if I travel to a location to shoot, let's say I go to uh, Mexico. To, to shoot, I'm probably gonna end up shooting at like a really like high aperture the whole time because I also came for the nice location. So I'm not gonna shoot at like 1.4 because I feel like I could have done that in Miami or somewhere else, you know. But no, I um, I enjoy a nice backdrop. I enjoy a really nice backdrop. It's it's just something that like takes the shot to like the next level. What are some tips for like other young photographers who are starting out in like fashion photography and love your work? Like what are some things that you've learned um, shooting fashion? Um, I feel like one, one of like the biggest things that I would say to people is to never like compare yourself to others because that could, that could like really wreck you, your mentality. Cause, um, I remember, like, when I first started, I would, like, compare my work to, like, a bunch of other photographers who are, who who have had more time with this, and, like, they've had more experience, and they've been through it, and I'm comparing myself with, like, one week of experience to their 20 years of experience, and it always, it used to make me so sad, and I would, like, say, oh, my work is horrible, but... After a while, I just learned to, like, not say that anymore and just learn to, like, love my work as it grows. So that's, like, the biggest thing that I would say to any photographer, like, learn to love your work as it grows. Um, It's fine to hate it sometimes, but just learn to love it and just, like, keep doing that. And also, um, if you want to be a fashion photographer, I feel like you should have some knowledge of, like, fashion and, like how it works and just studying magazines and studying like the uh, designers and stuff really helps um something that i love about fashion photography is that it's never like a one-man um effort you need a stylist you need your makeup you need your um, set design sometimes not always but like you need a full team so like it really helps you to like collaborate with people oh but by the way i was wondering where are you from um wait guess oh i don't play the guessing game i learned the hard way not to play the guessing game i'm nigerian that's awesome i'm nigerian yeah you Um, have a nice accent i was wondering where it's from thank you People always guess like a bunch of random places I've never been to, and I'm just like, no. Wait, no, like what? No. Tell us. <laughs> well, first of all, they guess French. I'm like, no. Yeah. Oh. Then they guess. I I usually get British a lot, and I'm just like, I've never been to the UK. And you, then I, I could get, kind of hear that. I also get Jamaica a lot, and I'm, I'm just I've never been there either. <laughs> Do you speak French though? Uh, I'm pretty. <laughs> bon. bon, I love this French conversation. We're fluent. Uh, we're, we're fluent. You know, we're like, we could probably like go to France right now and survive. Oh, for sure. Like we could probably get, <laughs> probably get like a sandwich or two. 
I'll Maybe. probably like get killed in France because I don't know what I'm saying half the time. <laughs> don't say that. <laughs> I would never let that happen. You fight for me, Jessica. I would literally fight with everybody in France. <laughs> I, think. I fight with everybody. When I go to Lebanon, I fight with everybody there. Like Oh, um, I know uh Sabaker. Wait, what? Sabaker. What is I'm, I'm, Am I saying that right? Is it Arabic? I can never yeah, I can never say right. What is it? Sorry, I'm like trying to say good morning. Sabahul okay. Khair. Okay, so <laughs> I, I can't do the H sound in Arabic, like, my voice just really cannot do that H sound. It's so annoying. Oh, cause... clearly me either. I just tried to say it and it was, like, butchered. Sabah al khair, basically. I'm never going to try because I'm going to butcher it again. You, no, but now that you... No, it's you. It's good. You're, you're saying it. Like, where'd you learn that? <laughs> uh, my friend from... Uh, he's from Kuwait. He taught me some Ooh, okay. Arabic words. But I forgot most of it. Well, if you need a refresher, I'm here with my broken Arabic. If you need help. <laughs> broken, Jess, you're like fluent. <laughs> right. Honestly, if I speak more, then I feel like I would be okay. But, you know, yeah. I'm sure Obi uh, understands. Like, when you're not speaking, like, your, your t- mother tongue language, then yeah. you just mm-hmm. tend to lose it, you know? Like, yeah. I grew up in Nigeria, so, like, I learned English and Igbo side by side. Mm-hmm. So, um, and I spoke them um, into like at the same time for like sixteen years of my life. Then I moved to then I moved to the U.S. and it was just like English all the time. And then at one point, like I had to like text my mom to ask her what this means in Stop. Igbo, and she was what? just like, "What are you talking about?" So now she's like, "Oh no!" So now I think in my native language. That's so really. Like, think in English, yeah. Because, like, it's only been, like, eight years, but still, like, it's easy to, like, forget it when you don't practice. Like, like mm-hmm. French. I did, like, 13 years of French. Th- wait, only and 13 I, years? Yeah, and I could, like, write essays in French. I could write more than I could speak. I could write write really well in French. But since I moved to the U.S., it's all gone. That's why I'm here. We're going to learn Arabic and French together. Broken yes. French, broken Arabic. <laughs> Let's do it. But, yeah. So you did photography in Nigeria as well, or did you start when you were in the U.S.? Um, so back in Nigeria, it was more of me taking pic- um, pictures of my sisters on my BlackBerry back then, like in 2010. Love it. BBM? Did you have BBM? <laughs> I had BBM. BBM was so fun. BBM was so fun back then. Um. I would, like, take pictures of my little sister. Like, she she loves herself. So, you know, like, she's perfect <laughs> for me to, like, photograph. And my big sister did makeup and hair. So she would, like, do, like, her hair makeup, put her in a dress. And I will take pictures of her. And we post on Facebook and BBM back then. And it was fun. And it wasn't until I started freshman year of college that I was, like, I should probably get an actual camera and like see where this can go. And I got a Rebel T3i back then. <laughs> I saved all my paycheck from that semester and, and bought one. It was it was only like six six hundred dollars. Um, I bought it. I I did like wedding photography, babies, animals. Hated them all. I was like, this is not for me. I hate photography. And then my good friend, Esther, I asked her to, like, model for me. And then she started, like, modeling for me. And that's where I started learning that I like fashion more than anything else. Even more than photography, honestly. Just fashion. <laughs> Just fashion. Fashion is so interesting. It really is. It. I agree. It's, it's, um, it can honestly say a lot without, like, saying anything. And that's why I like it a lot. So did you come from Nigeria to the United States for college? Yeah, for school. Yeah, I came here in 2013 for school. Nice. Yeah, and did you I finished straight? my first degree, and now I'm doing my master's degree. We saw that. You're such a baller. Okay, by the way, I saw what <laughs> do you have your uh, undergraduate degree in? In chemical engineering. I mean, 
I gotta log out right now, to be honest. I literally, <laughs> I was looking at your work and I was FaceTiming Jess and I was like, I'm gonna quit photography. This guy has like <laughs> three lives going on and I'm like struggling with one. <laughs> I have to realize them that like they're like they're all struggling. What yeah. I what what I noticed for myself is that whenever I'm like focused on school, my photography mm-hmm. struggles a lot. Mm-hmm. Whenever I'm focused on photography, my school work struggles a lot. So it's like I have to like pick pick which one I want to struggle at a at a certain time, you know. But no, it's a uh, it's tough. But we're, we're gonna get through it though. Amazing. So what's like the end goal for you? Are you trying to pursue photography more full time? Photography uh, more full time. Photography. Yeah, photography more full time. It's it's um it's definitely what. I've always wanted to do, even though I didn't really know that's what I've always wanted to do. Cause even from when I was young, my dad would have like all these, um, like, you know, all those, um, small silver cameras, he would have them and I would go to him and like take them and play with them until like I've used up his, um, his battery and, and he'll, and he'll get mad at me. Um, yeah. So I've always wanted to do it, but I've just never known. I've always thought I was going to be chemical engineer and like get a nine to five or whatever it is and just do that but ever since I started getting more into photography that's when I was just like this makes me happier so I'm gonna do this and luckily my parents although the African parents are like very 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 supportive they're like if it's engineering that makes you happy do it if it's if you if you if you rather do photography do it just make sure you're not broke and starving but we support you so um but yeah photography is definitely what i see myself doing down the line um i also see myself getting like a little nine nine to five to like um fund my photography habits but i don't know about that one yet we gotta pay for those lenses man that's expensive lenses are expensive oh my god I'm trying to buy a wide angle so I can actually like go like full on fashion, but which wide angle? I really want like a twenty or a twenty-four. Ooh, twenty-four. Do a tw- twenty-four. Oh, I was like, amazing. do a twenty. Mm, twenty-four. No, 24. But you can get a 24. twenty-four to seventy. The twenty though. I don't want like okay. So um, I think I might get one that is like an f four point five and above because normally when I'm shooting fashion, I don't even shoot. At anything lower than 4.5 if it's like hash lights who was i talking to about this was it you flander it's so weird you say that i was literally you read my mind i was saying this literally yesterday because like i only use 1.4 for when i'm doing like portraits and like headshots and stuff like that but apart from that when i'm doing fashion so if i'm trying to get the 24 to 70 2.8 that's like a grand right or more more honestly like i bought it used grand. i bought it used for um i don't know it was f- maybe 14 or 1500 you could probably find it used cheaper and i've had it for for a very long time it, it's okay. the 24 to 70 it's the yeah. second one and it's 2.8 it's really it's really a nice lens what lens are you primarily using right now for your shoots i only have my 35 millimeter 1.4 sigma great so, great lens sigma lens yeah great lens yeah. i i love it it works for like everything i've done like portraits uh full body it works for them but like again i'm trying to like go hardcore like you know like fashion is like so like long and just exaggerated that's what i want for my work and i can't keep using less question to like make people longer because that has to look weird that has to look weird after a while yeah i feel that i was shooting with an 18 for a little bit it's so wide 18 sounds amazing what? Oh my god! Yeah, but uh, and you're right. It's like there's this incredible distortion that comes with it. You have to be really careful. But mm-hmm. it, yeah. And but it's hard with primes because they're so attractive because a lot of them do have that 1.4, 2.0, 1.2 even. You're like, oh my god! Mm-hmm. Like, do you know how much more light that is coming in? Like, and it just it, it so depends too. Like the f fours that you can buy are significantly cheaper than any of the 2.8s on the market so you know it's like that's so worth it you're so right I think it's also just like if you just get a little bit better at knowing how to light then that f4 
is gonna mm. be incredible to work with. Yeah, like the no problem. It really just depends on where you when and where you want to shoot it with. Like, I'm not going to use that f four point five to shoot at like nighttime if yeah. if there's no light. But if I'm shooting like in Texas, that gets so much sun, like it's fine. Yep, totally. And I also use this big reflector, so normally I'm shooting at 7.1 or like 6.3 or something. Got mm-hmm. that sunlight. I can't relate. It's been like <laughs> raining and cloudy yeah. and snowing here. You need to move. I know, I know. I, well, actually, I don't mind the cold weather. But for photo shoots like yesterday, I was shooting and it was about to storm. And that was actually mm. really pretty because then you know the clouds are all oh. congregated in the same area. And, you know, yeah. it really shows in the background. So... That was really nice for my photos. I used the flash for the first time, like with my fashion stuff. I can't. Oh, the off-camera flash. Um, it was actually like a. It was a just a small external, like on top okay. of your camera flash. Yeah. Yeah, and the pictures okay. turned out great. And actually, it's funny you guys are talking about like the wide angle lens because I was planning on using my twenty four to seventy, and I went to take it out of my bag. We were at the photo shoot. Everything. I went mm-hmm. to. I went to take my camera out of my bag. I started to take a picture. And then I went to like zoom in and it wouldn't zoom. And then I looked at the lens and it ended up being my 85. I forgot my 24-70 at home. Oh. So I'm like, and exactly what you were saying, you can't take those long photos, like the wide angle. Like Mm-mm. if you try to do a low angle with like an 85, it's, it's not, gonna look you know. Weird. It's yeah. going to look very, very, very compressed. Like, yeah, no. So I, went, I had to drive home, get my <laughs> lens and drive back to the photo shoot. So that's the story of my love for the 24 to 70 this which is why i think you should buy it <laughs> i will i definitely <laughs> need to i saw this ad online they were trying to sell a, a 20 i think it was like 20 to something for like 250 and it, it seemed like a really good deal because um again they didn't sound like they knew what they were selling and i was gonna buy it then i got to check out and the lens type changed Oh, that's sketchy. And I was just like, I was like, uh, uh-uh, uh, nope, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm going back, just because like the way they spelled some words, you could tell that like they're not photographers and they don't know what they're selling. So right. I thought, I thought I was gonna be the one scamming them, <laughs> but they were gonna be the one scamming me. I was just like, nope, not today. So I turned around <laughs> and didn't buy it anymore. But I'm trying to buy one like soon, soon, soon. I know for this trip, I'm trying to go to LA sometime later this month or like early next month. And like, I need, 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 need a wide angle lens. Dude, let me know. If you come here, let's meet up. Let me know when you come through. Definitely. You should come by. (laughs) Yeah, I I try to be there as as much as I can. Um, That's my... So my plan was to move to New York initially, but... God knows I cannot do New York for more than two weeks. I'm the same. I New, York like New York is a lot. New York is a lot. New York is like, it's so nice. It's so fun. But after two weeks, I'm just like, can you just leave me alone for like a week? <laughs> this is too much right now. And and so I changed my plans to, okay, I'm going to move to LA. Because it, it's like a lot more laid back than New York. So um, I'm trying to figure that out now. So I'm trying to go as as much as I can to like make connections and like more friends and stuff like that. Amazing. Well, yeah, hit me up. Let me know. I'm here in quarantine (laughs) (laughs) going nowhere. So, you know what I wanted to ask you, Obi, because I think Mm -hmm. it's very interesting that you grew up in Nigeria and then you Mm -hmm. moved to the United States. You know, Nigeria is I mean, am I correct in saying it's predominantly black? Like, it is. yeah. So it then is. you go from, uh, you know, the uh, Nigeria, and then you move to the United States, where it's a lot more diverse. It, like, can you, do you did you notice like a big difference in you know the industry with photography? That was so. That was, that was actually one of like the bigger culture shocks that I had because like I didn't have culture shock per se because. I basically grew up like watching a lot of like Disney and like my cousins grew up in New Jersey so like I was familiar with, with what to expect in in the US but like race wasn't one of them so race mm-hmm. wasn't something that I thought about ever for 16 years in Nigeria I always just 
didn't i don't know it just didn't come to mind even when my mom's friends from italy would come visit us in nigeria i didn't ever like think about oh the white or the black and like coming to the u.s that's when i started to realize that oh race is a factor in how people like receive you and how people act around you so um with like photography for example obviously like if i'm gonna shoot someone like it's gonna be a black model and like when you see the billboards it's all like black models and when you see the when you see the magazines it's all black models and then and then we're told that oh like this is like the beauty standard and then you come to america and it's like no this is I, this is the beauty standard because like it's more um catered to you to your to your to your eccentric features so um yeah that was like one of the biggest shocks for me just realizing that what i've always known as the beauty standards wasn't fully considered beautiful in the u.s because of like race yeah. so more of a personal question but have mm -hmm. you ever have you experienced racism here in America since living here? And did you ever experience a type of racism or see that in Nigeria? Um, so I, when I moved to the U.S., I did my undergrad in Arkansas. So yes to racism. Oh, wow. I, uh, one thing that, that I would say is with my school in Arkansas, it wasn't aggressive racism. I would say that it was very like a lot of micro aggressions that somehow became like bigger than just micro aggressions. But I remember like one of like one of like the most intense times for me in Arkansas was in 2016 when um, 45 became president in November. And uh, I walked into my apartment and my roommates were like chanting, build that wall, build that wall. Just like, <gasps> I was like, oh, I guess I'm moving out then. Wow. The next semester I moved out, like, I, I just wasn't going to have it. I just moved out because um, I wasn't trying to like put up with that ignorance. But um, apart from that, it's just, it's just been like, a lot of like small things when you hear someone say oh she's pretty for a black girl and it's just like how about she's pretty period not she's pretty for a black girl or like you know just you just hear like a lot of offensive things that i personally didn't didn't start to realize these things were offensive until spending some time in america and like understanding race in america because coming from Nigeria like I didn't understand how those things were offensive and then after a while it was just like that's offensive don't don't say that and I would like try to educate people but some people just don't want to be educated they're just they're like set in their ways and it's just not gonna change ever so, so that's why there... I lose them <laughs> you know we have a racism problem in America, mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. And this Black Lives Matter movement has been a bubbling point. It's been a culmination of mm -hmm. a history of racism in our country. Um, and I think you have such an interesting perspective coming from like a country like Nigeria where, you know, Black is beautiful. That is just the beauty norm and the standard. And you come here and you're kind of shocked by the racism and the microaggressions and the things that you see. Is there any sort of equivalent in Nigeria or in Africa of um, racism? What I would say is like tribalism. And it's just like tribes mm -hmm. having beef with, with each other. Um, that's like the main thing that I would say. It's... Um, and the way tribalism is set up again, it's it's like it's all like a power structure. Like one tribe clearly like has more positions in the federal government, so like they're obviously going to like take care of their people more than the other tribes. So it causes like a lot of um, unrest. So like Nigeria got her independence in 1960, and in 67 there was a there was a war that broke out in Nigeria, and that was because, like, so I'm Igbo, 
um, so it was in the east, uh, south and east of Nigeria. So those guys, we wanted to separate from the north and the west, which was the Aosan and the Yoruba um, tribe. So that um, that's how like the war started and um, it got shut down in like three years, but it was so brutal. Um, it killed a lot of people. And I feel like that was never really talked about as much. Um, I didn't even learn it, learn it in school. Like, I, I had to go read about it later on. But then, like, because it's not talked about, like, there's this unspoken animosity that, that just gets, like, carried down the line. So that's what I would say is, like, the major form of, like, discrimination in, like, Nigeria. I can speak about Nigeria. I'm not sure about, like, other African nations, though. Yeah. I th- and again, I think you have such an interesting and unique perspective that's important. Mm-hmm. Um, not growing up here and coming in as a person of color. It was very um, interesting seeing, seeing how that played out over time for me. Because um, I also had to do a lot of, like, unlearning. So it's like, when I came here first, I, I don't know, it was just like a lot of things that I heard and I saw and I thought it was whatever, it was fine. Until after a while, you start to realize that it's not okay and like something has to change. I feel like, I feel like where you are on like, where you grow up in hasn't, hasn't, um, has an effect on who you are as an um, as a creative because like it's all part of what molds you into who you are um like if i grew up in france i'll probably be a different um photographer than i am right now or, or if i grew up in morocco or, or like anywhere else really so me growing up in nigeria is the reason why i create the work that i create now and i feel like people need to like start like acknowledging their location their setting for because that really helps with what you're creating and how you create it and stuff like that but some other advice that i would give to like young people is to not like it's like not jump on the trends because the trends are not your story yeah the trends are fun but the trends are not your story like it's fun for you to do like uh um Hobby Lobby um, uh, photo shoot or whatever, like that's fun. But like, when that's all you do, it's just like, come on, like, what else is there to your work? You know, like I've seen people who just do like the same trends over and over and over, and it's just it, it doesn't feel like we're getting to know who they are as an artist. We're getting to know who you are as a as a as a social media. Um, user but like not as not there's nothing personal about it to me so yeah just as uh as a beginner in this industry like i would say to not try to focus all of your work on the trends it's fun and all but just not too much of it yeah don't get caught up with the hype i think it's you know, there's a there's a lot of trends that also that come and go. So you might be trends. popular for that week doing that trend, but then exactly. what about long term? I always say like think long term. Trends come and go. Trends come and go all the time. Like the reason why I even gained like any following online was from like posting like my before and after, and like I did that the first time. Like it got traction, and I did I did the uh, second time, and then it got love as well. But I just said that I'm not going to keep doing that because then that's all I'm known for. And I feel like if people can't like appreciate my work as, as it is without having like any other gimmick behind it, then like, I don't know if I'm doing it right, you know? And like, that's, that, that's like something about Twitter that makes me mad that like people don't just like post their work as it is like, I'm a huge fan of posting your four pictures and just saying like, these are my four strongest shots from this shoot. Enjoy it. And there's no 
before and after there's no bts which those things are fine don't get me wrong they are very fine but if that's all you do every single time it's just like is your work strong enough to stand on its own that's absolutely that's something that bothers me about the creative culture right now yeah for sure there there's definitely a healthy balance between being aware of trends and knowledgeable of like the space that you're in Mm -hmm. and things that are happening and even bringing it back to you know these people who were distasteful with the black lives matter movement photos it's like it was insensitive and not thought through and you know it's like to to be aware you know we just happen to be photographers and this is our community Mm -hmm. and it's our responsibility to be a voice a voice of reason and in all of kind of like the noise that's happening and Mm -hmm. and speak up and like you're saying too like on twitter it's like you gotta like speak up and have a personality it's not just enough for your work to stand alone you have to even if it even if you're like just saying stupid stuff like most of what i say is just me just random just like saying random stuff like last night i said something about one of Rihanna's songs and it was like um SNM where they were like um I saw, Sticks I read and it. Stones I read and it. I was just like I was 14 singing that what did I know about that and <laughs> it's just like it's just fun it's like light-hearted I'm not saying like that you have to be like an activist activist but just like using your platform when you're needed and not just not just when it's a trend to use your platform like at all times like use your platform if you see an injustice going on call it out don't wait until it's, it happens to you don't wait right, until it exactly. personally affects you don't mm-hmm. wait until there's um a protest going on in like all 50 states to like say something like we need more people to be more proactive and just more like aware of the environment they're in because like america is the melting pot like everyone says and it's true because like you see everyone here from every country and it's amazing and at the same time it's destroying us because like people choose to look at what like people choose to like look at the bad differences and not like the good differences Mm -hmm. you know and it's just if you like if you have the platform and you can say something say something and don't just be like quiet about it i think the most important thing too is be genuine in your intentions and don't do it just because oh now the movement has you know what i mean just be Be genuine. genuine that's something that so again like i'm not trying to call out like any brand so i'm not gonna name names but um one of them like after a lot of like black photographers on Twitter like called them out, they put out a statement. At that point, it's just like, it feels like you're laughing at us at that point because why would you put out a statement after you've been called out by 20 people on Twitter? Like, it doesn't feel genuine at that point. It just feels like, oh, I'm doing this to like save myself from being canceled or whatever, which honestly, they're so big they're not going to get cancelled by a few people on um twitter so but still like it would have been nice if they would have said something before be um beforehand yeah there's it's not the first time something like this happens it's not it's not I'm like i saw um i saw the other one and uh they had donated some stuff to the virginia police department like a few days ago and like people were like oh this was before George Floyd happened and I was just like George Floyd is not the only reason why people are protesting like there is a history behind all of this George Floyd is the straw that broke the camel's back like this has been going on we've been screaming about this since forever like there's been Trayvon there's been um, Eric Garner Tamara Rice Sandra Bland like I could go on and on and it's not just happening now because Judge Floyd was killed it's happening now because all of this has happened and there hasn't been any real justice given to these to like these um people that are murdering on and 
slash innocent black people in the streets. Um, so it's not just now that it it's not happening now because Judge because Floyd of this happened. one incident basically. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's, it's a combination of hundreds yeah, of Michelle, years of oppression. Exactly, exactly. It's so much that has happened that like people are trying to like say screw it. I'm not going to like sit down take it in. I'm like it's not like. The way that I see it is like the fight has ever like gone bigger than just police like it has it has it, it has also like gone to certain spaces like you see with like influencers are like like Jackie Aina she's a, a big makeup um um influencer she called out brands on her Instagram and she called out like Fashion Nova Pretty Little Things, uh, Revolve, and, like, makeup brands. And she was like, I see you guys always trying to participate in black culture, but now that it's time to speak up, you're not speaking up. And it's like, people are starting to become more aware of the brands that they're following and the brands that they're, that, like, that they're supporting. Because it feels like these brands are like, okay, I'm going to use this group to get what I want. But when it comes to actually supporting them, they're not supporting the um, the people who support them the way they should support uh, the way they should. So it's like the movement has gone past just police killing um, innocent black people. It has it has gone to the um, point of like there needs to be a complete overhaul of the system and not just the government, but also like the brands and like how how they're responding during these times and what they're doing behind the scenes to, you know, make sure that something is being changed. And I just think it's a beautiful um, revolution going on. Can I just say, I hope the photographers who, let's let's just say they're not very inclusive. They've just been shooting one type of skin tone. I hope if you're listening to this, you see this more as a time to reflect and just think about going forward, how you can be more inclusive. Mm-hmm. And, and I would hate to think that, you know, photographers take this as like a personal attack or anything. It's truly not. Um, so just, just take this time and to educate yourself and... And to see, like, you might think you're just shooting a model and it's not a big deal, but diversity is so important. A hundred percent. Yeah, we all should be using our voice, voting, doing all that we can. Thanks, Obi, again for coming on. Um, We appreciate your time. And if you want to know more, we'll link everything below. You can follow us on YouTube and Instagram at Light News Podcast. And you can check out our website at lightnewspodcast.com. And until then, we will see you guys next time. Bye. 